Okay, hello, lecture six. Production and disposal analog electronics. So particularly hoping to give you some pointers in the development of your PCB during your coursework. Hello. And then uh, but give you some broader information about PCBs more generally and if you're out there in the real world developing PCBs for a living. And so I want to talk about these issues really is the design of the device, production and what that entails, not, not necessarily as simple as you might imagine. And something that's cropped up in the last few years as well is disposal as well as we're gradually polluting the planet with these mountains of toxic substances um, that, that, that are left over from all this equipment that we're, we're putting out there. The first thing to bear in mind is the very development of PCBs themselves can sometimes be a bit more complicated than you might first imagine. Um, familiar with the idea of being on breadboard and things like that and all the problems that that entails from this course. You might then move up to strip board to eliminate some, some of, the, of the issues involved with with developing your device uh, on breadboard. I think we're all too familiar with that. And then we'll probably move on to a PCB as well. But the thing to bear in mind as well is that the PCB development process is itself multi-staged. And so people often talk about this thing here, brass board, which is the first, which is the first go at a PCB development environment, really. And um, so one of the typical things that keeps cropping up is this sort of thing where you might get cut tracks, bodged in components, and just general on the fly modifications. Um, and that's, and that's uh, working out stuff that might have slipped through the in at first two parts of your development process. And so depending on the requirements that, they, that the actual device is going to be uh, needing, when it goes out into the outside world, the production PCB might be quite different from what's called a brass board or a sort of a pre-production PCB. And I'm going to talk about, give that a bit more detail in the next slide. So a few, few things just to bear in mind when you're developing PCBs. Um, first thing, obviously, is in your pre-production world, you're probably dealing with way fewer than 10, component, uh, ten, 10 actual samples whilst uh, you go out into the real world and depending on what you're building, be up to millions of these things. So, and that's going to massively affect the sort of balance of how you expend your efforts and resources. So you might make something that's very simple to build in your pre-production process. The cost of the parts and the assembly are negligible because most of most of your cost in the pre-production is going to be in non-recurring costs, design, layout and things like that. And these are all the issues that you'll be dealing with in the coursework now. So because your, your devices that you'll be building are very much in this category here. But then if where we were, were to go and productionize all this, there'd be other issues as well. So you suddenly recurring costs would be immensely important. And you'd have to deliver a whole load of peripheral parts to the parts to the product, documents, bills of materials, the actual uh, procedures for assembling the thing, all those things that are going to going to require to put the thing into a factory production environment away from the lab that you're familiar with. So a good example of this is something I came across on the weekend. My dear wife, very, very talented woman, but always dropping her iPhone. So I've become something of an expert on the internals of the iPhone 4. Very interesting. <coughs> now, this is a classic example of a piece of electronics which has been optimised for the tens of millions price point in development. So we can look at this very efficient. That is pretty much the entire motherboard of the internals of an iPhone 4. 
Uh, so all that functionality squeezed into that device and also a very odd shape as well in order to, for it to fit into the, into, into the actual device itself. So design tools, are, th this should be fairly, uh, fa fairly much familiar to you already, already familiar with Design Spark and Eagle and whatnot. So just to recap, it's really just a placeholder to remind you that these design tools are going to be used everywhere. And they also have other features generally built in as well, such as auto placement and auto routing. And, and the obvious things uh, and other things as well, like checking for track spacings and things like that. I think Steve and Paul showed you some of those examples of those sort of features that are built in. And it's, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that because they are, uh, they're going to vary slightly and they all have their uh, strengths and weaknesses. So um, I'm not going to talk about it anymore, apart from the fact they exist. So bear in mind your process, uh, and again this should be fairly familiar to you. Start out with your schematic, and then draw that out into a basic PCB. Now the PCB, there'll be, there'll be a tool to describe that PCB, and this, this is a word you'll hear, a bit of jargon, so as you can see here, I've put it in a jargon buster in the next slide. The special file format tool. Uh, sort of de facto industry file formats for describing what those PCBs are and, and some manufacturing information as well. And then we pass them over and in the, and in, in the case of your project it's going to be Stephen Paul, probably Steve, to manufacture those. So the point is that this is a process which is semi-automated and only se semi-automated. The Gerber format is this industry standard image file uh, which allows us to describe all the layouts of the PCB and things like the, the, the silk screening and things that goes there as well. And so you'll sometimes hear people talking about Uwe Gerbers that caught me out when I first heard, it, heard about it for, for a device. And that will be those descriptions. And the Exelon format for the actual machining that needs to go on as well. So, obviously different kinds of PCB. We could talk about a single-sided PCB, but I'm going to take it up a level here, double-sided, because this is probably the sort of device which we'll be creating for the coursework. And a simple double-sided PCB, so we're using two sides of a simple piece of, simple piece of boarding. And the key point, though, is that it will have these things called vias, and vias are very useful for carrying signals around each, around other ones and things like that for creating bridges. So very, very effective if one's got a very simple circuit, such as we're developing here, easy to manufacture, and reliable to manufacture, and, uh, and thus cheap. And a very nice... Uh, side effect of all this is the fact that, of course, when we're actually developing the thing, particularly in that pre-production phase, we can uh, we can get we can access all those signals, so we can push a scope probe down onto here, for example. But there's only so far that a, uh, a double-sided PCB can take us, because as the complexity of the circuit goes up, the uh, uh, and the number of signals that we're having to pass around goes up, we can end up with very long tracks to go all the way around the components and things like that. When it would be preferable to, to, to have uh, more layers in that. And so there we have multi-layer PCB, a lot more expensive and a uh, lot more complicated to construct because obviously we're laying down many, many layers. As, as we build the thing up. And so you'll tend to see these multi-layer PCBs in productionized versions of kit uh, because they do bring all sorts of advantages. Typically we can actually squish the amount of electronics in. So our iPhone 4 um, multi-layer PCB uh, was, would be very much very much an example of this where we're trying to shoehorn everything together, we're trying to keep all the track lengths to a minimum as well. So as, all, as with all these things, 
uh, horses for courses. Sometimes you're forced into a multi-layer PCB, but keep it as simple as you can, keep the costs down, keep the reliability up, and keep your, your options open for development. So a few good rules, I mean, as we've seen all this already, and uh, also routing programs will tend to enshrine these kind of ideas for you. But a few good points here just to bear in mind when you're laying out your PCB. Keep, keep your, and the first one is think about your power routing. Make sure, for the first thing, make sure those tracks are wide enough to take the amount of current that you're going to plan to push down them. And keep them short and well laid out. So here's a bad example all over the place. So as you well know, that's going to be both a capacitance and an EMC hazard now. But there's all sorts of pros and cons as well to bear in mind. So for example, the other day we were looking at routing this here, but if once we've soldered our device down onto this piece of kit here, uh, onto this tracking, we could maybe, we might discover that it's actually quite hard uh, to debug it. And so if, for example, there was a solder splatter there somewhere that uh, could, could cause problems without us knowing it. So again, as usual, pros and cons. Much of the same rules apply to signal routing as well as power. Uh, try and keep our tracks obviously as short as possible, but also equal lengths and not huge routing things like that. Remember those pictures from the previous from the previous lectures. So why do we want equal lengths? Think propagation delays. Think race hazards. So the key point here is that the development of the very PCB itself is like a whole extra component that we're creating. It's not just a thing to bolt our devices down onto. It's actually part of the product itself. And the quality of that product will be affected by the quality of that component. So bear that in mind. Now, talking of the components... Bear in mind as well that there are a lot of different packages out there and the number of packaging methods is proliferating all the time. We're very familiar with these dual in-line packages which have been around for decades now. They're gradually giving way to these, uh, app, these, these small outline packages or surface mount and we'll be, we're obviously going to become familiar with that in this, uh, in this course. Now, I've, I've, I've emboldened those in the in the slide because but those will be the two that are really going to affect us in this, pro, in this course but be aware that there are even more sophisticated packaging options out there particularly for very large complex chips like sophisticated microprocessors so the first one are these pin grid arrays and then even more complex than that ball grid array as well and as we discussed last time the, uh, this introduces all sorts of problems with how on earth do you test and debug the thing when you can't actually put a, a, a probe anywhere down onto the device. So we have to introduce things like our JTAG devices. Packaging's evolved a lot, so it just to give you an impression of how these things have shrunk. And in my experience, certainly, once we get down to beyond this um, small outline package, Pretty much man manual assembly of your PCB is pretty much impossible. It's going to be hard enough, I think we'll find, laying down our surface mount devices as they are. Dips fine, but even those come with the frustration of having to drill good holes in the PCB for the, uh, for the through pin to go into. So, pros and cons really. Also bear in mind, and this is particularly important as you move from your pre-production phase to your production phase, the same devices can come in different packages. There's obviously certain constraints. You're not going to be able to shoehorn a, a Pentium into a, into a ten-legged ten dip. But for, think, for simple devices, like this example here is a good old 7404 that we've been using, you can get that in a surface mount package as well. And so different options, you may choose to use the through hole dip version for your prototype and your breadboarding, and then move to a, a surface mount package 
whereas you go to PCB uh, and productionize the thing. So soldering, here we go at last, think about it. And particularly, you might want to bear in mind your soldering and how good you are or not at it as you design the PCB. Give yourself plenty of room. The bigger the blob, the better the job. Is that your motto? Mm, think about it. Be careful. So, good. Sorry. Good soldering. Mm, not so good soldering. What's this doing here? And here's an interesting stuff. This is solder paste. We're going to see that again in a second. So, uh, I'm going to let the, uh, let the technology do the talking for a minute or two now. And just play this video, which I'm hoping will be very helpful for your development. So, this is somebody from YouTube who's obviously making a very good living out of surface mount soldering. Good for him. And all the different aspects that we want to use. This equipment, quick advert there. Now, here we go. Get a nice small soldering iron now. This is going to be interesting in our lab. I'm hoping we can get some decent kit when the time comes. Interesting point there. Make sure your surfaces are clean. Make sure it's well, your, your iron is well, well tinned. Now this is the interesting bit. Stick it down first, secure it. And you'll notice the big thing I'm seeing there is the way he's exploiting the surface tension of the solder to get it to flow right and stick that, stick that device down and get a good electrical contact. This is the bit I like just coming up next. Whoa, that was a close one. That sort of thing, you need to really bear that in mind that there are techniques for avoiding that and also getting yourself out of trouble if it does happen. Now, use of solder paste, this is a good one. There, very interesting on there. And there's a few solder splats there. doing is tacking, working very well. Yeah, as you can see this guy is extremely practiced at this. So this is one of those ma magic moments that could go well, could go badly. So the rule appears to be prepare your work, get ready, maybe practice, and then move fast. Very nice soldering, very deftly done. a good example of a well soldered fire. We'll come to look at that in more detail in a second. Excellent video. Something I hope uh, can explain what we're trying to achieve far better than I could, I could demonstrate or describe to you. So things will go wrong. I want to talk about failures for a bit now. Um, and as it says here, generally falls into two categories. <coughs> Manufacturing failures, we made, a, we made a bish of making the thing, and things that will fail in service. Now it's important to understand that there is also an overlap between the two of those because it's possible to make a manufacturing failure, as you can imagine, which plants a little ticking time bomb in, in the circuit, 
ready for it to fail later in service. So look at this, and also it can be very subtle. Look at that tiny solder, f solder hair there, which can cause absolute fiasco in our circuit. And the thing is a more general symptom of this badly made solder joint here. And but then in service, with the best will in the world, the component pops, it's going to blow. So let's talk about those two items in more detail. Manufacturing problems, so bad soldering is the obvious easy way to do it. Pity the poor, if pity the poor factory workers are working out there probably in China most of the time, soldering these things day and night, and they're just flesh and blood like the rest of us. Tiny mistakes can be made, some of, the other, some of them are impossible to identify. Like this one, look, very tiny dry joint being introduced here due to that bad soldering. This is due to poor automated manufacture. Look, slight damage to that. That might have been during storage or during manufacture. And here's some bad soldering. So we saw that almost happen uh, in the video a moment ago. There's also a few other issues you can come up with as well, like the, the component being slightly misplaced on the PCB. So depending on whether it's a human or a, or a machine placed part, that could be more or less a problem. It's also possible with bad soldering technique. You can overheat your components and cook the component because you've been holding the heat down on it for so long. And that's a classic example. You might frag it during manufacture or you might weaken the component so badly it dies later. So bear that one in mind. And then in service problems, the things can fail for all sorts of different reasons. So bad maintenance, people stuffing, we talked about this earlier in the previous lecture about bad maintenance, people stuffing connectors and things like that. Vibration, EMI of course, e as we discussed for that particular lecture, EMI can weaken components as well as uh, destroy them in a one-off. And also components have a natural lifetime. So this is what's famously called the bathtub curve and components typically fail quite frequently early. Uh, in their lives and then there's a long, uh, on average, a long reliable phase before things start wearing out and the, uh, the bathtub curve is a very important concept in mass production and um, so you can see that it's possible to have a sort of burning period so you might deliberately want to uh, run your components during that period to flush out any infant mortality as they call it. But then, yeah, with the best of the world, and the thing corrodes, and there's even fungus that, that will live on your components and metabolise the very, com the very substances that they're made of. And that, and that sort of thing really brings us to the whole point about disposal as well. All these different substances and things like you might you think, oh great, we'll spray some fungicide down on our components. To, to prevent them being corroded or eaten away by fungus. And net result, we get all sorts of noxious substances in our devices. And frankly, in the current climate, most of those noxious substances end up in the third world and, and with people attempting to recover in very, very crude fashions. The, the hazardous and precious substances on. So here, We've got gold, sure, we can melt down our equipment to, to gold, to, to, to extract the gold, but all sorts of other things as well. Uh, lead, cadmium, and some really, really nasty organic substances as well. I think we'll talk about in the next slide. Oh no, yes. Um, so because of that, and something I approve of, is, is the e, an EU directive came out a few years ago, trying to, if not ban, then at least limit the amount of these dreadful uh, substances included in our electronics. Uh, so at least we can try and stem the tide of the thing. It's by no means a solution to the problem of uh, electronic waste, um, but it's a step in the right direction. Yes, the EU has got this Restriction of Hazardous Substances Directive, it particularly talks about things like lead and mercury, which uh, I probably don't need to explain to you how toxic they are, and some really other subtle, more subtle ones as well, like we've already come across uh, the nasty old cadmium, uh, but also these, these special, all sorts of bromine-containing 
uh, organic substances that are used for things like flame retardants uh, and corrosion protection and things like that. Not good, very bad for you. And so you can see they've set these limits here and notice that cadmium is regarded as 10 times more, more ha uh, hazardous than all the others. But even 0.1%, that's actually not a huge cap because you don't need much of this stuff. It causes some real damage to people out there. So it's a step in the right direction. So the point is, try and avoid these, these substances if you can, because they will escape and ruin the planet. And so hand in hand with that is, that's about the manufacturing, hand in hand the EU has also got the, uh, <coughs> the Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment Directive. And this is all about the, the, the other side, the end of life side of things. And you probably, if you look closely on your consumer devices, you'll see this little symbol here. And this is an attempt to prevent the, all this equipment just ending up directly into the landfill. At least it's recovering. To be honest, right, what's happening right now, once that electrical equipment is recovered, isn't that great. It's probably going to end up in China or India or somewhere being stripped down and recovered in a very crude fashion, but at least it's a start. And I'm hoping that in the next couple of decades, much more sophisticated recovery techniques will come on. And that's got both an economic, but much more than that, it's got an environmental and a, I think a moral imperative to it as well. So there's all sorts of things covered by this. Uh, apparently a big one at the moment is uh, as all these cathode ray tubes, the old style uh, monitors and TVs are gradually uh, leaking out of existence and being replaced by flat screens, there are some really noxious substances inside cathode ray tubes. So the world is currently being polluted by those, all sorts of phosphors which do some really nasty things to bones. And a whole load of other stuff as well. I mean, I was saying that CRTs are, are being replaced by flat screens, but they come with their own frustrations as well, not quite as bad as CRTs, but can't take her off the ball. There's all the old, the, all the old culprits like uh, asbestos and refrigerants and things like that. All of them need to be scooped up and captured. There's also radioactivity out there as well, which is more, which is more common than you might think. So, for example, smoke alarms. A lot of them contain a tiny radioactive source, and that's how they work. <coughs> so, all this sort of stuff, all over the place, all this, all this equipment, very lights up here, can contain some substances that need to be at least captured and, uh, if possible, recycled. So that's it really, a few things to bear in mind and, uh, and I've tried to, what I've tried to do here is, is, is put in, in your mind about how the whole life cycle of your PCB counts, particularly if you're building um, mass production equipment. And the, other, the first point I've made there is that the PCB isn't the end, it's just the beginning of the end and it very rarely get right first time. So you probably want to design your initial PCB to make it easy to debug. Something we, we talked about last week was put, build expecting a debug and test phase. But don't expect to get it right first time. Keep, keep your options open when you design your first PCB. And think about failures and how you're going to detect and debug those failures and, and, des and design around them. And then Finally, of course, think about the whole life cycle of your device. Is, um, for, for, these, for very small numbers, not such a big problem, uh, but for mass production, yeah, there could be millions of these things being made, so there's both an economic imperative, and as I say, I think a moral one as well, um, to, to avoid pollution. And, think of, and so people are particularly thinking these days in terms of designed for disassembly as well as assembly. And that can be done. Okay, thanks very much, and see you next time.